Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. As always, I'm your host, Simon. I was here. One of my writers in this case. Who wrote this? Arnaldo. Thank you, Arnaldo. It's Rasputin, demon saint, prophet, healer, spy, question mark, exclamation point, question mark. Um, thanks, Arnaldo. I've never read this before. That's the format of the show. We're going to read it together and explore. I do know a bit about Rasputin. I mean, I covered him in videos previously. Isn't there something about, like, he was impossible to kill? Is that what we're going to be decoding today? Because I think it turns out, like, it's like, nah, it wasn't, it wasn't as amazing as everyone thinks, and it's kind of, like, embellished. Anyway, Rasputin, let's dive in. It's June 1915. Night falls over Moscow. The weary citizens seek solace inside the welcoming walls of the Yar or Fury, a popular restaurant and nightclub. Restaurant and nightclub, I don't understand. Like eating in a nightclub? It's like restaurants, quiet place where you generally have conversation. Nightclub, very loud place where it's impossible to talk to anyone. What are you supposed to do? Like, I've been to bars. <clears throat> it seems like something more like when I was a student or a younger person. But you'd go to a bar. And you'd be like, yeah, okay, let's eat a little. But the music's so loud, you're kind of just eating crappy food while there's enormously loud music playing. You're like, what? What do you say? <laughs> I don't get it. I don't get it. I generally hate nightclubs anyway. I haven't been to a nightclub in a good decade. And I don't miss it at all. Like, that is a young person's game. And fuck that. <laughs> it's just so loud. And there's so much drinking. Now it's like an old man. I'm like, loudness and drinking? No, thank you. <laughs> Here, they can share a drink, a song, or the latest gossip about the royal court. Oh yeah, this is pre-revolution Moscow, of course. The Russian Empire has been fighting in the Great War against the Central Empires for almost a year now, and the people are not happy. Moscovites are quick to blame the emperors, Tsar Nicholas and Tsarina Alexandra, for the disastrous conduct of the conflict. But they are even quicker to blame their friend and spiritual advisor, an uncouth Siberian peasant called Grigory Rasputin. This man likes to portray himself as a mystic, a healer, a sage. <laughs> Peasant is a word that comes up in my household surprisingly often because uh, I live in Prague, as people probably know by this point. And the word for peasant is also the word for like farmish or like, you know, like, um, you know, like if you get like a yogurt that's like farmer's yogurt or whatever, you know, where it's like trying to appeal to like, I don't know, it's like marketing or whatever, but it's cell scare which is so you'd have like cell scare butter, which means like farmer's butter. But it also means peasant. If you don't, like, if you, I put it into Google Translate, I was like, oh, is this cell scare butter? And it's like peasant butter. So whenever I, it's just an ongoing joke between my, ah, I see you bought the peasant butter, yes? Hilarious, Simon. Thanks for that personal aside. Let's continue. This man likes to portray himself as a mystic, a healer, a sage. But spicy rumors swirl untamed around Moscow and St. Petersburg, telling tales of a drunken Rasputin engaging in unchecked carnal congress with aristocratic ladies, and perhaps even with the Tsarina. Yeah, Rasputin's a fascinating one, isn't it? Because he's like, he smells, did he not bathe very often? He's kind of just this smelly peasant. And somehow, he's got such god-level charisma that he works his way into the royal court, and like, people love him. And it's like, but Rasputin, you're a smelly peasant. Selske peasant! Suddenly, the attention of the Yar patrons turns to a thin, tall, bearded man causing a drunken ruckus a few tables apart. The man looks familiar, and of course he does. It's Grigory Rasputin, the mad monk. Rasputin, visibly and irreversibly smashed, jumps onto a table, lowers his trousers, and reveals to Moscow his swinging and impressive manhood. As the crowd gasps, the Siberian bellows, this is the tool that rules Russia, before which the Empress prays. Oh my lord, dude, are you asking to get executed? Holy shit. This is perhaps one of the most famous anecdotes about Grigory Rasputin, which contributed to perpetuating his legend. Stories like these inspired Boney M's 1978 single, Rasputin, and its immortal lines, R Rasputin, lover of the Russian queen, there was a cat that was really gone. R Rasputin, Russia's greatest love machine. It was a shame how he carried on. I feel like I know this song, but I have no idea how it goes, and it's honestly better for you that I don't try and sing it. Bob Dylan surely did not lose sleep over these verses. His crown as arguably popular music's greatest lyricist remained unchallenged. But the 1978 disco hit was nonetheless effective in perpetuating the dark legend of the so-called mad monk. Was he a demonic lover, a saintly healer, a prophet, or perhaps even an opportunistic spy? I mean, all of the above. If you are even remotely familiar with the character of Rasputin, chances are that you've been fed a highly sensationalized version of a complex, well-rounded, and contradictory human being, as we all are. <laughs> That's very nice, Leonardo, just assuming that everyone is well-rounded and complex. 
Some people are just simple. <laughs> If you heard about Rasputin, you probably heard him des described as a schemer, a manipulator, a devious, alcoholic con man who ingratiated his way into the court of the Romanov Tsars to manipulate their policies while threatening the virtue of the Tsarina and her daughters with his robust sexual appetites. A subsection of this school of thought claims that Rasputin was in fact a German agent directed by puppet masters in Berlin who sought to weaken Russia's leadership and knock the country out of World War I. In recent years, circles close to the Orthodox Church and Romanov loyalists have spun a different take on Rasputin, portraying him as a quasi-saintly figure, a miracle worker capable of healing the sick and predicting the future. Well, we know they're wrong because miracles to heal the sick aren't real and neither is predicting the future. I mean, these things are both real, in a way. Like, miracles happen. Someone has, like, terrible cancer and then it goes away. And you're like, oh my god, <laughs> you defied the odds. You're like that one, like, 0.1%, aren't you? that everyone hopes for. And then predicting the future, of course, is possible. Like, I can predict that I'm gonna have lunch today. It's gonna be a turkey salad. Boom. Easy. Unfortunately, Rasputin's reputation was ruined by slander thrown at him by enemies of the Tsar. The thesis of this revisionist take is that during the 1910s, both left-wing revolutionaries and ultra-conservative circles wanted to get rid of the Romanovs, either to replace them with a communist republican government or with another autocratic ruler. And by attacking Rasputin, these factions sought to indirectly discredit the Tsar. Also, those who wish to portray Rasputin as an orthodox religious icon like to splash intriguing brush strokes of a spy story onto the canvas. Rasputin was known to have advised the Tsar against entering World War I. As such, he was despised by the Entente allies. Could it be that his assassination may have been orchestrated by the British Secret Services? Well, it's been a hundred years plus, so I get the feeling this is something that would have come out. Like, there'd be declassified documents, or someone would have spilled the beans. So the fact that this is the first time hearing of it does make it seem quite unlikely. But let's see. All right, I'll pause now as there's a lot to deconstruct here. In fact, the more you look at Grigory Rasputin's life, the more you find for decoding the unknown fodder. Did he really have supernatural healing powers? Was he able to accurately predict the future? Was he really at the center of a conspiracy involving the German and or British secret services? I think we can answer those questions with no, probably not, and well, maybe who knows. Oh, there's another one. And what was he really like beyond hagiographic myth? Hagiographic, I need to look that one up, Arnaldo, you big brain. Is a biography or a saint or ecclesiastical leader? Okay. Uh, and salacious slander. As a first step, let's take a look at the man's biography. Along the way, I will point out which elements are normally incorporated into Rasputin's life accounts despite being overly exaggerated or plain made up rumors. I shall then deep dive into the more mysterious elements of his legacy. But. Before we kick off, may I recommend to those viewers and listeners who are not driving, working, or locking, looking after children to pour themselves a glass of Madeira wine? Apparently, this was Rasputin's favorite alcoholic beverage. <laughs> you just have to slap some of that hand. It's like, yeah, pour yourself that Madeira wine that you've been keeping in the cupboard. Does anyone have that? I've never even heard of that. Or maybe I have. I feel like I have heard of it. I will personally uncork a bottle of dry Cercial and down a glass every time I'm forced to type, apparently or allegedly. Wish me luck and excuse the abundance of typos before we get to the end. I'm like, whoa, this script's like 20-some pages on Aldo. <laughs> what am I going to be in for by the time we get to the end of this? Life of Grigory. Grigory Efimovich Rasputin was born on January the 21st, 1869, in the town of Pokrovskoye, a province of Tobolsk, Western Siberia, back then a part of the Russian Empire. Grigory was the eighth child born to Anna and Efim, a farmer and government courier. The Rasputins did not live ex exactly in abject poverty, but life was not easy either. Grigory had eight siblings in total, but only he and his younger sister survived into adulthood. Oh my god, six of them died? It's like, oh no, his, 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 bring, his you know, upbringing wasn't that bad. Only six of his siblings died. Not much is known about Grigory's early years. According to most popular accounts, he was something of a never-do-well as a teenager, allegedly being arrested at one point for the theft of a horse. Apparently, this was a rather serious crime in Siberia back then, which carried a lengthy prison sentence. Yeah, horse theft. Didn't it used to be, like, punishable with death in some parts of the world? Because, like, horses were seen as so important. According to historian Douglas Smith, author of Rasputin, Faith, Power, and the Twilight of the Romanovs, published in November 2016, this horse story is worth as much as the intestinal product of said horse. Grigori was in fact incarcerated for a brief period of time, but only for insulting a local official. By the way, Douglas Smith is probably the only biographer of Rasputin who's actually sought confirmation of his life stories in official records. <laughs> if that's the, he's the only one. 
What are you? What are the other biographers doing? Just being like, yeah, yeah. I guess I'll just take that rumor as fact and write it out and sell a book. Yeah, I guess books aren't peer reviewed, are they? So people just be like, I was into dating. What a good book. It's thanks to Smith that we're able to discuss Rasputin's life in a balanced, non-sensationalist way. So. Allow me to raise a toast to that legend's gone out like drinking his wine. The other thing we know about Rasputin's teenage years is he underwent a religious awakening at around the age of 15 or 16. According to author Sergei Fomin in his seven volume, Jesus, Grigory Rasputin in Investigation, this spiritual crisis came after Grigory witnessed the accidental, tragic death of a younger cousin. After the event, the young Russian went on a pilgrimage to St. Nicholas Monastery in Verkhotuya, Western Siberia, where he remained for several months as a lay worker. Interesting point here, Grigory never took vows, so the moniker Mad Monk is a misnomer. Another interesting point, Rasputin remained semi-illiterate throughout his life, and yet he acquired a profound knowledge of scripture simply by listening to priests reading the Old and New Testaments. Most contemporary biographies speculate that during his pilgrimages, the mad not really a monk joined a religious sect known as Clisti or Flagellants. Wait, the Flagellants people are going to like beat themselves <laughs> like it's like i had an impure thought get the whip according to their doctrine sinning was the best way to get close to god okay <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting take isn't it hence the clisty engaged in prolonged exhausting orgies yeah yeah okay it's okay it's like what's it what's the tenets of your religion where we all have we're incredibly sinful because we think it gets us closer to god mm -hmm. now get naked the sect's teachings have been incited as influencing rasputin's later alleged sexually deviant conduct so if you believe in Team Demon, a Rasputin seduced or simply assaulted every woman he came across, Team Saint claims that he was a poster child for monogamy and moderation. So let's bring in Douglas Smith again, shall we? Smith admits that the Clisty were active around the same time and place as Rasputin, but there's no proof that he actually came into contact with the sect. As per his sexual behavior, it appears that this was, in fact, inappropriate. In his adult years, the Siberian mystic was often surrounded by adoring beautiful young women and he often took advantage by groping and pinching them. But again, there is no conclusive proof that he engaged in any orgiastic rituals or non-consensual sex. In February 1887, Grigory married Prashkovia Dobrovina, and the two would sire seven children, of which only three survived past childhood, because of course it was the past. This was only like 130 years ago. I know it's like only 130 years, but it's pretty wild. Like nowadays it's like, that would be insane to have that many children die. It'd be like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. But back in the day, they're like, hey, it's why we had so many. They didn't even have names. The Rasputin's firstborn child, in fact, died in 1893 at the age of four. Upset by his death, Grigori returned to the monastery in Verkotoya to meet his spiritual teacher, Father Macari. During this encounter, Macari recognized Grigori's magnetic presence and talent as a preacher, singling him out for a spiritual mission to the empire's capital, St. Petersburg. Rasputin would not travel immediately to the capital, however, spending the ensuing ten years in almost constant pilgrimage, traveling across Russia and even to Mount Athos in Greece and to Jerusalem. It was during this decade that he built a reputation as a preacher and a staret, a sort of self-proclaimed holy man. The staret first visited St. Petersburg in December 1903, returning in October 1905. On this occasion, Grigory carried a letter of introduction to Bishop Sergei, a rector of the local theological academy. Sergei introduced him to the inspector of the academy, Father Theophan, who happened to also be the confessor of the imperial family. Wait, is this the person who goes and hears the confessions? Oh my god, can you imagine, like, for someone so powerful, you'll be like, oh, I know secrets. <laughs> and they're like, they're telling you all the shit, because that's how they believe they're going to heaven, right? To get, they have to be forgiven by, like, a priest or some shit. Oh my god, he must know everything. And through Theophan, Rasputin was introduced to high-ranking members of the aristocracy. More precisely, to Princess Malika and Anastasia of Montenegro, wives to Grand Dukes Peter and Nikolai, themselves members of the imperial family. Now, these Montenegrin princesses were nicknamed the Crows, the Cockroaches, or even the Black Peril, due to their penchant for intrigue and love of the occult and the supernatural. Therefore, they warmly welcomed into their circle this obscure Siberian staret with a reputation for miraculous healings. On November the 1st, 1905, Grand Duke Nikolai introduced Rasputin to Tsar Nicholas II Romanov, 
and his family. Apparently, he made a profound impression despite the size. I mean, it's a pretty large fish to fry at the time. You see, the Romanovs were sitting on a pretty shaky throne following the defeat with Japan in September 1905 and the onset of the revolution in 1905, which had undermined the autocratic rule of the Tsars. Without getting into too much detail, it's important to note how the Tsar was unpopular with both the revolutionary and the ultra-conservative factions. Critics of Nicholas II commented how the Tsar appeared to be controlled by his wife Alexandra, herself unpopular due to her German descent, and Alexandra was rumored to be a puppet in the hands of the scheming starrett Grigory Rasputin since the end of 1907. So, why exactly at the end of 1907? Well, apparently that's when Rasputin first performed a miraculous healing on the Romanov's three-year-old son, Alexei. Oh yeah, doesn't he suffer from some blood disease, if I remember right, or some kidney disease, maybe? Since birth, the young prince suffered from haemophilia, a condition he inherited from his great-grandmother, Queen Victoria. Haemophiliac patients suffer from a deficiency in factor VIII, a clotting protein. That means that even small wounds or traumas may result in excessive bleeding, even life-threatening bleeding. Blood loss may occur internally, into joints or muscles, provoking intense pain. That sounds miserable. Can we treat that these days? Do they have stuff to treat haemophilia? I feel like yes, right? Somehow, Rasputin's intervention caused a bleeding episode to stop. The Tsarina Alexandra was awestruck by the Siberian's healing powers and summoned him to court on several other occasions. According to author Sergei Fomin, Rasputin healed Alexei in March 1912, October 1912, July 1913. Oh my god, a whole bunch of dates through to 1916. We shall dive deeper into these healing occurrences in a later section. Following the first, apparently miraculous, healing of little Alexei, Rasputin was invited to court every time he popped up in St. Petersburg and gradually became a confidant to the royal couple, mainly to Tsarina Alexandra. And allegedly, through his influence on Alexandra, he was able to manipulate the Tsar himself, steering his decisions, his policies, and even deciding behind the scenes important ministerial appointments. It's kind of amazing. Like this guy, I mean, obviously he's not healed this kid, so it's just like some con that he's doing or whatever. But it's kind of impressive. Like he's just ingratiated himself and now he's in the halls of power. Just like that. Charisma. Charisma. A good old pal, Douglas Smith, downplays Rasputin's influence. Sure, Tsar Nicholas went down in history as a particularly incompetent and weak-willed autocrat, but according to Smith, rather than being spineless, he was simply not interested in ruling. This lack of interest manifested itself in another way. When Rasputin advised Alexandra toward a certain decision, Alexandra asked Nicholas to implement such a decision. The Tsar would go, yes, right, whatever you say, dear, and then do absolutely nothing, or it enact someone else's advice. Nonetheless, Nicholas tolerated the presence of Rasputin at court as it had a calming effect on his wife, who was often subject to deep anxiety. He once told Prime Minister Pyotr Stolopin, better ten Rasputins than one of the Empress's hysterical fits. <laughs> but Russian elites at the time had a different view. They saw the Siberian mystic as a negative influence on the court, one that could instill in the Tsar's unwanted concern toward the plight of the masses, the poor peasants. Oh, oh, the horror. <laughs> oh no, he'll make us think about the poor people. I hate thinking about poor people. Oh, gross. This is when the slander campaign towards Rasputin and indirectly the Tsarina first began. Since 1909, the mystic had been under the watchful eye of the Okhrana, the feared Tsarist secret police overseen by Stepan Beletsky and later by General Zhuzhangovsky. And the police filled their reports with accounts of Rasputin's scandalous conduct. Yes, it is true that the mad monk overindulged in Madeira, and yes, when drunk he could erupt in rambunctious dance routines when it was least appropriate, and definitely he behaved inappropriately with his female companions and frequently sought the services of sex workers. But according to Smith, the Okrana overplayed these elements, peppering in allegations of sexual assaults and even scandalous rumors of an affair with the Tsarina. By 1911, Prime Minister Stolypin had bought into this narrative and convinced the Tsar to expel Rasputin from court, but Alexandra pleaded on his behalf, Nicholas caved in, and the mystic oh, was once again welcome in St. Petersburg. Rasputin continued to collect enemies, however. One of them was an orthodox priest called Father Illidor, allegedly jealous of his influence in spiritual matters. According to the author Sergei Fomin, Illidor inspired an assassination attempt against Rasputin. This took place on June 29, 1914, in his hometown of Pokrovskoye. A young woman called Chionia Gaseva, believing Rasputin to be a R-wordist, thank you YouTube, you can guess what that means, it's a type of sexual assault, a false prophet, and the Antichrist, and she stabbed him in the stomach. Despite the bad wound, the Starrets managed to fend her off with a stick until she was arrested. Gaseva was found not guilty for reasons of insanity and confined to a mental hospital. Rasputin was also hospitalized and underwent a long and painful recovery throughout July of 1914. 
All the while, a major crisis was developing in Europe. Just the day before the attempt on Rasputin's life, Archduke Franz Ferdinand had been shot in Sarajevo, and the continent was on the brink of war. From his hospital bed, Rasputin sent some 20 telegrams to the Tsar, pleading with him to stay out of the Great War. One of those telegrams contained a prophecy. If Nicholas entered the conflict, it would be the end of Russia and the Tsar. Now we'll get into the details of the prophecies in a later section. But as far as predictions go, this proved to be accurate. And to be fair, one doesn't need a mystic with supernatural powers to get this one right. War doesn't usually bring happiness and prosperity, and Rasputin was a well-traveled man who had rubbed shoulders with both the common folk and the elites. He might have correctly assumed that the Russian economy, institutions, and military were not prepared to wage war against Germany and Austria-Hungary. He also knew that Nicholas's throne stood on very fragile legs and that a disastrous war might cause his downfall. Yeah, it's not rocket science, is it? It's just like, okay, well, look at this and look at that. That's probably what's going to happen. Done. I'm sure his advisors had, or maybe the advisors just shut up and be like, yes, your majesty. <laughs> a war we shall have and a war we shall win, your majesty. And Rasputin's like, bro, no, it's not going to work. As predicted, things didn't go well for the Russian army. Seeking a scapegoat, Russian elites doubled down on their slander toward Rasputin. That is when the famous story about the incident at the Yar restaurant started circulating. The scene I described at the beginning, when Rasputin aimed his artillery at the patrons, claiming that it was the tool that ruled Russia. So, who oh, is the story true? Well, once again, we have Douglas Smith and his debunking powers. To quote him, what I was able to do is in Moscow, at the State Archive of the Russian Federation, was to finally get a hold of the police files on Rasputin, which are voluminous, massive, and by going back and looking at the daily reports of what had happened, I was able to see very clearly that the whole story was invented by police higher-ups in an attempt to frame Rasputin." End quote. It seems that Rasputin wasn't even in Moscow in June of 1915, but he did relocate to St. Petersburg after September 1915. That's when Tsar Nicholas took overall command of his troops and left the capital for the front, delegating internal affairs to the Tsarina, who promptly summoned Rasputin to court. He would be dead little more than a year later healing powers. The murder of Grigory Rasputin is the stuff of legends. You may have read or heard the classic story according to which he was tougher to take out than a coked up John McClane on steroids and that it took massive doses of poison, a severe beating, several bullets and a plunge into a freezing river to finally kill him. We'll get to that a bit later, but first allow me to cover his alleged healing powers. According to modern sources, openly pro tsarist and pro-Orthodox, Rasputin healed at least two individuals following traumatic incidents. The first was the daughter of Prime Minister Stolopin, severely wounded in a bombing attack perpetrated by Marxist terrorists on August 15, 1906. According to newspaper reports of the time, however, the girl died as a consequence of her injuries. You know, it's like, wait, so he didn't hear her at all? Heal her at all? She just died from a bomb. That's it. The attack also wounded Stoyapin's younger son. According to author Joseph Furman, Rasputin did visit him at the hospital, but there's no account of the mystic attempting to heal him. The second healing allegedly took place when Anna Voyerabrova, a lady-in-waiting to the Tsarina, was involved in a train crash in January 1915. Voyerabrova lost the use of her legs following the accident, but credited Rasputin's prayers for saving her life. Now, the only primary source that I could find related to Vyra Brova was her interrogation conducted in May 1917 by the Extraordinary Commission of the Provincial Government installed after the Revolution of February 1917. For context, this is the earlier revolution which installed the government of Alexander Kerensky, later toppled by Lenin's October Revolution. Yes, this was a turbulent time in Russian history. There were the two revolutions, right, super close to each other. In the interrogation, Vyra Brova is thoroughly grilled about hers and the Tsar's relationship with Rasputin, whom she staunchly defends. And yet, she does not say a word about the train crash and its consequences. I understand that she may not have been willing to claim that she was miraculously healed in such an official context, but I find it curious that she did not even mention that Rasputin visited, comforted, nor prayed for her on such a distressing occasion. Therefore, I'm inclined to dismiss this healing claim as it may have been inflated or created by a pro-Rasputin author. Yeah, if the primary sources say no, then there's no evidence. It, there just seems to be no evidence, so you can't just be like, oh, it's true. You've got to prove it's true. Let's focus on the more frequent, better documented instances in which the Siberian Starets intervened to cure Prince Alexei's haemophilia. 
Just like any young child, the Tsarevich was prone to falls, bumps, and minor accidents while playing around. Being a hemophiliac, however, this meant that some minor physical trauma could result in major bleeding due to a deficiency in clotting factor. The doctors at court were mostly impotent to treat this condition, but it appears that Rasputin was able to stop the bleeding simply with the power of prayer. For example, in December 1915, the Tsar's sister Olga documented in her diaries how Prince Alexei had been bleeding in pain after yet another incident. As the doctors fumbled about, Rasputin was summoned by the Tsarina on December the 6th. The mystic showed up at Alexei's bedside and made the sign of the cross over him. Apparently, that's all it took to stem the hemorrhage. On other occasions, Rasputin didn't even need to be present to perform his miracle. Back in October 1912, Alexei suffered a fall while getting out of a boat, which resulted in a hemorrhage in his thigh and groin. The eight-year-old prince lay in a state of feverish pain for three weeks until the Tsarina and lady-in-waiting, Anna Verabova, sent a telegram to Rasputin, who was in Siberia at the time, asking him to pray for Alexei. Rasputin's reply soon reached them, God has seen your tears and heard your prayers. Do not grieve, the little one will not die. Do not allow the doctors to bother him too much. And the bleeding stopped soon thereafter. A miracle? Um, if I remember this correctly, weren't the doctors doing something? It's like, because these were back in the day doctors. So maybe they were like giving him leeches and sh**. And Rasputin's like, yo, 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 no medicine. Stop with the leeches. And because this is the past, it actually worked. Something like that, right? At least according to the Anglophone, Orthodox, and pro Tsarist outlets, it is a miracle. They appear to defend Rasputin and the Romanovs at every occasion, painting them in a saintly light. Now, I'll not go into details of each single occasion in which Rasputin allegedly healed the prince, but they seem to fall into two cases. Either the mystic simply prayed by the boy's bedside, or he explicitly advised for the doctors not to bother him. That last detail was highlighted as significant by Swiss author Pierre Gillard, who worked at the Romanov's court as a French tutor to Alexei and his sisters. According to Gillard, the court doctors insisted on administering aspirin, which is a blood thinner, right? Because they give it to people who have had strokes or have like high blood pressure or something like that, right? To reduce the risk of stroke. Uh, it was to relieve the, cause pain, the, the pain caused by his bleeding episodes. At the time, aspirin was still a relatively recent drug, be used primarily as an anti-inflammatory to manage fever and pain. However, the drug is also a thinning agent, currently still prescribed to prevent blood clots and ischemic strokes. There we go. Gillard clearly had more scientific outlook than the Tsarina or her sister, and speculated that the aspirin prescribed to Alexei actually prolonged the bleeding episodes. Thus, by shielding the young patient from the doctors, Rasputin didn't actually heal him, but inadvertently prevented the hemorrhages from getting worse. As I mentioned earlier, Rasputin did not explicitly overrule the doctors on every occasion, but we can speculate that his mere presence at court implied the absence of medical professionals, even if not stated explicitly by the witnesses. Now, there is another element to consider here. Currently, hemophilia is categorized as mild, moderate, or severe based on the levels of clotting factor in the blood. Several patients may, severe patients may experience life-threatening blood loss, sure. Mild or moderate patients, however, may experience prolonged bleedings, but these may eventually resolve by themselves. And here I go with my own two cents here. Patients affected by severe hemophilia frequently suffer from spontaneous bleeds with no apparent cause. This was not the case with Alexei, which leads me to speculate that he suffered from the mild or moderate kind. Hence, it may be possible that Alexei's hemorrhages may have ceased by themselves, given enough time, proper rest, and, you know, the absence of aspirin. Yeah, so, of course, it's not a miracle, it's just, like, chance, and I don't think he knew this about the aspirin, right? It's just he did it once and it worked, so he did it again. Like, don't give him drugs or don't see the doctors, which can look very convincing if you don't know what's going on. Prophetic powers. So, we have discussed Rasputin's alleged healing powers. Now let's dive into his alleged prophetic skills. The mystic is said to have predicted the fall of the Russian Empire, as well as a series of cataclysmic events enveloping Europe and the entire planet. To assess if and how he got anything right, let's take a look at his predictions that most commonly are found online. According to TsarNicholas.org, a website which advocates for the sainthood of the Tsar, Rasputin predicted the execution of the royal family with these words, quote, Whenever I embrace the Tsar and Tsarina, the girls and the Tsarevich, I shudder with horror, as if I embraced the dead. Then I pray for these people. I pray for the imperial family, because the shadow of a long eclipse falls on them. Um, that's not predicting their death. <laughs> People are like, you just want to read into stuff afterwards, right? Like Nostradamus and stuff. So we did a de decoding about Nostradamus. And it's like, we'll just read into that so much. It's crazy. The prophecy went hand in hand with another prediction about the fall of the empire and the rise of Soviet Russia. 
To quote it, darkness will descend on Petersburg. When its name, name is changed, the empire will end. Russia's capital, St. Petersburg, was in fact renamed to Petrograd at the start of the Great War, and the Great War was the catastrophe which eventually led to the revolutions of 1917 and the dissolution of the empire. So, one may argue that both prophecies are quite accurate. An instinctive reaction would be to say that given the political climate of the early 1910s and Russia's performance in the war, it would not have been difficult to guess a grim future for the Romanovs and the old institutions that they represented. Yeah, it seems like no one liked them, and it's like that's a dangerous position to be in as an autocrat. Rasputin's prophetic visions went well beyond the triumph of Bolshevism or the execution of the Romanovs in 1918. The mystic predicted an overall future of doom for the European continent. Well, I mean, yes, but also no. It's like, yeah, there was a bad war that came, but also I live in Europe. It's pretty nice. Seems okay. For the most part. For the most part. I know there's obviously problems in Europe. Uh, to quote him, People are heading toward disaster. The most inept ones will drive the wagon in Russia and in France and in Italy and in other places. Mankind will be crushed by the march of madmen and scoundrels. Wisdom is bound in chains. Uh, it's it's just super generic. Like, reading that now, you could say that, and it'd be like, yeah, okay. You could say that today about different places, and it'd be like, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's probably going to happen at some point. Like, you would taken long enough for you. Rasputin also foresaw the arrival of three hungry snakes who will crawl across Europe, leaving ashes and smoke behind them. These snakes have been interpreted as symbols for three world wars, the third of which is yet, yet to come. Europe will also be divided by two rulers. Quote, a bloodthirsty prince will come from the west who will enslave a person with wealth, and another prince will come from the east who will enslave a person with poverty. Okay, so we're saying like Stalin and Hitler here, or what? So a western prince whose rule is based upon wealth, and an eastern one whose rule is based upon poverty. It all sounds like, oh yeah, no, wealth would be Cold War, right? So I don't know why I said Hitler and Stalin. It would be like past that. So like the west, um... America, capitalism, and the East, uh, communism. Don't know why I said Second World War, just being stupid. The world, however, will have to contend with more than just war and political division. No prophet worthy of his name can call themselves a prophet without throwing in some planetary level disaster. And Rasputin does not disappoint offering a broad catalogue of cataclysms that would leave Roland Emmerich moist and heaving in ecstasy. Who's Roland Emmerich? <laughs> we got earthquakes to quote earthquakes at this time will become more frequent the lands and waters will open and their wounds will swallow people and belongings followed by climate change and or tsunamis quote the seas will enter the cities and the land will become salty and there will be no water that is not salty a person will be under salty rain and will wander on salty lands between drought and flood the rose will bloom in december and in june there will be snow Next, nuclear accidents and radiation poisoning to quote, towers will be built all over the world. They will be castles of death. Some of these castles will collapse and rotten blood will flow out of these wounds, which will infect the earth and sky. Oh, it's just like, yes, in retrospect, you're like, oh yeah, it kind of sounds like vaguely this, but there's, it, it's just cherry picking. And for the final stretch, irresponsible genetic engineering. Quoting again, monsters will be born that will not be humans or animals irresponsible human alchemy in the end will turn ants into huge monsters that will destroy homes and entire countries well still waiting on that one remarkably specific <laughs> when the invasion of the giant ants comes from genetic engineering i guess we'll all know rasputin was right but fear not for this smorgasbord of misery will just be a prelude to the second coming of jesus this should have taken place on august the 23rd 2013 nope 2024 still hasn't happened after a storm should have burned the planet's atmosphere nope atmosphere seems fine destroying most forms of life. I think we're all all right, to be honest. <laughs> it's been 11 years. So more than 10 years have passed since, and I didn't see no flaming storm, let alone Jesus. And yet, one may argue that Rasputin did get everything roughly correct, right? Uh, uh, it, it, no. <laughs> it's a giant ant The only problem here is that all the prophecies I mentioned come from secondary sources, and to be fair, not even the most reliable or impartial kinds. I can't really understand why, but it seems like some websites and publications are willing to dish out the most outlandish claims without citing their primary sources. I'll tell you why, now, because it gets those clicks, baby! Thus preventing honest and partially intoxicated scribblers, such as yours truly, from checking such claims. But fear not! For I have found a passing mention of Pious Reflections, the 1912 pamphlet in which Rasputin allegedly, apparently, wrote down his prophecies, or rather he dictated them as he was semi-illiterate. And I did find a translation of the Pious Reflections on a portal for students learning the Russian language. I've read the Reflections, which contain some profound thoughts such as, 
Do not look at threats of the demon, at evil tongues. Pray and do good deeds. This is a reproach to the enemy and victory over evil tongues. Genius. Or again, quoting, The evil tongue does not love God. The demon trembles. An evil tongue is worse than a demon. It is afraid of the sign of the cross and trembles with humility. But an evil tongue is quiet and slanders. Evil did not make friends with God. Again, profound rasput and well done. But it contains none of the reported prophecies from earlier. No, in fact, there are no prophecies whatsoever. Therefore, all the material we have left to analyze are second-hand accounts, probably written years or even decades after Rasputin's death. Why are you going to write them after Rasputin's death and make them up? Why not make them more accurate? Be like, yeah, there's going to be a dude called Hitler and Stalin, and there's going to be a war, there's going to be communism, this kind of, you know? You know, just... If you're writing it afterwards, you might as well get super specific. And this makes it impossible to even start ascertaining whether the mystic had the power of divination and prediction. Okay, to be fair, there are two promising exceptions. Two pieces of correspondence apparently dictated by Rasputin in his lifetime. The first is the telegram sent to the Tsar in July 1914, advising him not to go to war lest the monarchy crumble. But as mentioned earlier, this was more of a piece of sound strategic advice rather than an actual prophecy. The second piece of correspondence is a letter written by Rasputin shortly after his death in which he predicted his own assassination and the ruin of the Romanovs. To quote, I feel that I shall leave life before January 1st. I wish to make known to the Russian people, to Papa, Saint Nicholas, the Russian mother, Tsarina Alexandra, and to the children, if it was your relations who have wrought my death, then none of your children will remain alive for more than two years, and if they do, they will beg for death, as they will see the defeat of Russia, see the Antichrist coming, plague, poverty, destroyed churches, and desecrated sanctuaries where everyone is dead. The Russian Tsar, you will be killed by the Russian people. I mean, yes, okay, that's that's mostly accurate, but it's also like it was a time when the Russian Tsar and was immensely unpopular. He, it's not hard to see that that could change. As we'll see later, the mystic was indeed murdered by the Tsar's relations, and Russia did suffer untold misery under the First Civil War and Bolshevik totalitarianism later. So, quite impressive, yes? Well, not according to Alison Hudson, a writing for Skeptoid.com. Ooh, I like Skeptoid.com. Hudson writes that this death letter first appeared in the 1920s memoirs of one Aaron Simanovich, a friend of Rasputin's. Simanovich claimed to have received it from the Tsarina Alexandra and kept it after the entire Romanov family was massacred by the Bolsheviks. So once again, we're dealing with second-hand information written after the facts had taken place. Yes, 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 so it can't be trusted unless they had that original letter and they somehow managed to like carbon date the ink on it and stuff like that. But even then, you could just be like using older ink and older paper and writing it out. Maybe there's some clever way science can figure this out, but I doubt that's happened. Maybe the letter's not even around anymore. It just, it's way too convenient, isn't it? Death of Grigori One of the facts in question is Grigori Rasputin's own death, an event which has contributed largely to his legend as a quasi-supernatural being. Rasputin's assassination took place on the 30th of December 1916, and it was the result of a plot etched by Prince Felix Yusupov, husband of the Tsar's niece, along with four conspirators. Yusupov saw Rasputin as a danger to the Romanovs and Russia itself and devised a plan to lure the mystic to his own Petrograd, formerly St. Petersburg, basement apartment, where he would be served tea, cakes, and wine laced with cyanide. According to Yusupov, the first part of the plan went as expected. In the night between the 29th and 30th of December, Rasputin gorged himself on the rich, poisonous buffet, but he did not go down. At around 2 a.m., the conspirators became impatient. Rasputin had to go fast, lest they have to dispose of the body in the light of day. At 2.30 a.m., Yusupov took charge, grabbed a revolver, and shot Rasputin in the stomach at short range. <laughs> That's fucking sad eyed so I can fuck this. The mystic lay on the floor for almost an hour when the murderers noticed something stirring. In Yusupov's own recollection, quote, All of a sudden, I saw the left eye open. A few seconds later, his right eyelid began to quiver, then opened. I then saw both eyes the green eyes of a viper, staring at me with an expression of diabolic hatred. This is when Rasputin proved to be allegedly nigh indestructible. According to Yusupov, the Siberian leapt to his feet, bowman blood oozing from his mouth, and charged at the aristocrat. To quote him again, he rushed at me, trying to get my throat, and sank his fingers into my shoulder like steel claws. Rasputin shoved Yusupov aside, and fled the building, as the other conspirators gave chase, firing their pistols. As Rasputin ran through the building's courtyard, two bullets hit him in the back and through the head, knocking him to the ground. That's gonna take him out. <laughs> He's already got shot in the stomach an hour ago. 
And so, was the headshot fatal? Maybe yes, maybe not. To be on the safe side, Yusupov grabbed a club and proceeded to clobber his unkillable target. Then, he and the conspirators removed Rasputin's body and dumped it in the Malaya-Nevka River. According to some second-hand retellings of the event, Rasputin was still breathing at this stage, and the freezing waters of the Nevka finally killed him. The same sources even claim that when his body was recovered, his right hand was held up as if he'd been making the sign of the cross, an indication that he may have survived for a while, even after the icy plunge. Yusupov's account of the assassination contributed to building the legend of Rasputin as a superhuman character, feeding into the narrative of those who want to paint him as either a demon or an angel on Earth. This version of events, however, is in stark contrast with the autopsy report, which tells a different story. <laughs> autopsy report's going to be filled with facts. The autopsy was performed after Yusupov had already confessed to the crime, so the coroner in charge looked for traces of cyanide in Rasputin's body. The surgeon did find a large quantity of alcohol in his stomach, no doubt Madeira, but no traces of poison. And this can be explained in a couple of different ways. According to author Sergei Fomin, Yusupov delegated the poisoning part to an accomplice, V. A. Maklakov. At the time, Maklakov got cold feet, and instead of lacing Rasputin's refreshments with cyanide, he used aspirin instead. An alternative explanation ventured among skeptoid users, among others, is that Yusupov simply lied in his account of the murder. The aristocrat embellished the assassination, portraying it as a sort of epic boss battle, in which the health bar of an almost indestructible Rasputin gradually took hits from poison, bullets, beatings, and freezing water. Other findings of the post-mortem confirmed that Yusupov may have been an unreliable narrator. He claimed that Rasputin took one shot from the front to the stomach and two from behind to the back and head. The autopsy found that Rasputin took two shots to the back and a frontal one to the head. This suggests that the mystic was first shot from behind, fell to the ground, rolled over, and then took a final bullet to the head, killing him. This is another important point, by the way. The coroner found no traces of water in Rasputin's lungs, hence he could not possibly have been alive when he was thrown in the river. There's another point of contention regarding Rasputin's assassination. And that is the involvement of the British intelligence services. Oh yeah, I forgot that he might be a spy, but probably not. According to author Andrew Cook, one of the conspirators, and possibly the one who fired the fatal shot, was British spy Oswald Rayner, a good friend of Yusupov's, since meeting in Oxford as students. In a way, the British connection would make sense. Rasputin was notoriously opposed to the war, while the British agents in Petrograd were striving to keep Russia in the fight as long as possible. Sergei Fomin is a proponent of a similar theory. According to him, the British Prime Minister himself, Lloyd George, ordered Rayner to orchestrate the murder. The motive? Lloyd George intended to harm the Romanovs and Christian civilization by killing the Tsar's spiritual mentor. This claim was investigated by Douglas Smith in his quest to desensationalize Rasputin's life. Smith scoured through the British National Archives searching for any evidence of Rayner's involvement, but found nothing that corroborates it. Yeah, and it's been like a hundred years. It's gonna come out. I took a peep too and found that the British ambassador to Petrograd, George Buchanan, was aware of a plot to murder Rasputin well in advance. Even Rayner's superior in Russia, Samuel Hoare, had been informed of the conspiracy by Vladimir Parishkovich, or one of the plotters, back in November 1916. Finally, Yusupov wrote in his memoirs that the day after the murder, he dined with Rayner, noting that he knew of our conspiracy and had come in search of news. So if Rayner was in search of news, he was not there on the night of the murder. Fine, okay, Yusupov is not the most reliable source, but there's no solid proof of Rayner's culpability, so we have to assume his innocence. So what do we have proof of? What we do have proof of, however, is that British intelligence is well aware of an impending assassination and did nothing to prevent it nor warn the authorities. Well, yeah, it's not really in their interest. Just because they're behind, not behind it doesn't mean they're going to be like, oh, let's tell. It's like, no, they'll just be like, cool, yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> Carry on. We can speculate that Rasputin's death served their goals exactly and their inaction effectively amounted to a blessing. Yeah, <laughs> but importantly, no, it didn't. Like, legally, it's like, oh, no, you shouldn't do that. Should you? You definitely wouldn't want to do that. That would be brilliant. And now we've entered the realm of spy stories. Let's tackle a final mystery around our favorite Siberian wandering mystic. As soon as the first slanderous rumors began circulating in the early 1910s, Rasputin was said to conspire with Tsarina Alexandra to further a German agenda. The Empress was, after all, German in origin. When the Great War started, these rumors picked up pace, morphing into something more concrete. The implication that Rasputin was a spy on Germany's payroll and his pacifist stance was simply directed at removing Russia from the conflict. As a tactic, it would be a sound one. Influence the ruler of an enemy country by puppeteering, said ruler's unofficial advisor. In practice, would this tactic have worked? As we've learned, Rasputin's influence over the Tsar 
has been overstated. He may have been able to direct the Tsarina's actions, but when Alexandra approached Nicholas to relay the latest piece of evidence from the mystic, the Tsar typically reacted by ignoring it. If the German secret services were not stupid, and I guess they weren't, why throw time, money, and effort at a tactic that was clearly not working? Legendary legend Douglas Smith could not let this claim pass, though, and he plunged into the German National Archives. Wow, this guy does his research. He's like, yeah, no, it makes no sense, but just to doubly prove this, let's, you know, look through really old documents. Interestingly, he found that German intelligence did keep a close eye on Rasputin to the point of fascination, but in reality, they did not control him. In fact, Berlin's agents wondered who controlled him, if at all, and they even vented the idea of bribing him, but they did not carry out with his plan. In Smith's own words, this quote shows beyond any shadow of doubt that he wasn't a spy. There was no link between him, the Kaiser, and Berlin. Conclusion it's now time to cork the bottle and draw the conclusions of this long Madeira-fueled overview of Rasputin's life, death, and alleged miracles. Al on Aldo, there's, there's no errors. This all flows very nicely. You can handle your Madeira. My own opinion is that the legacy of Grigory Rasputin has become a symbolic battlefield for supporters and denigrators of the Romanovs and the Russian Empire as a whole. In one corner, we have those who say Nicholas and Alexandra were great folk, Rasputin was their friend, and he was also a saint. But bad people conspired against them, and so they slandered both the royal couple and the mystic. And in the opposite corner, we have another faction shouting that the Romanovs were incompetent fools, the epitome of a worn-out, ill-advised institution. Their best power was this demonic, drunkard, sex-addict, mad monk, so they all deserve to be wiped out. What authors such as Douglas Smith have reminded us is that Grigory Rasputin was neither a demon nor a saint, he was a human being. He did not perform miraculous healings, and his scant predictions were based on common sense. He did appear to have something of a sex addiction and behaved inappropriately with his admirers, but he did not indulge in orgiastic rituals, nor did he seduce the Tsarina or her daughters. He did not bend the Tsars to his will, but he did discuss some policy matters with the royals, although Nicholas was not overly receptive to the ideas. He was his own man, and he did not rely on paychecks from Berlin, and though he did not endure massive amounts of punishment before dying, but went down with a bullet shot on the head, just like any other average Joe. What seems to be lost in the hail of conspiracies, miracles, and gigantic manhoods is that Grigory Rasputin was a semi-illiterate commoner from a remote corner of the Russian Empire who, through sheer will, faith, and a good amount of help from the right connections, worked his way up to a close friendship with autocrats in charge of the largest country on Earth. And that is remarkable enough in itself. The Siberian mystic would have deserved a place in history even without the exaggerations of the Okhranas, the pro tsarists or the Yusupovs of this world. And bonus fact! During my research, I've encountered some outlandishly bonkers conspiracy theories about Rasputin, okay, let's go, which I decided not to include because it was too difficult and I was tired, bored, and filled with Madeira. <laughs> okay, I'm glad to get a little bonus taste of them, though. But hey, I got to the end of the piece in one piece, and now I kind of feel tired, bored, and filled with Madeira, so here goes the weirdest one. According to an anonymous source, great start for a conspiracy theory, Grigory Rasputin was none other than the latest incarnation of an immortal being known as the Count of Saint Germain, who attracted much attention and prominence in 18th century France. Saint Germain is believed to be an immortal being who pops up at key points in history to bring about momentous change. <laughs> All according to a very, really anonymous source. And so it was that Saint Germain popped up in Russia as Rasputin with the goal of paving the way for the Bolshevik Revolution. But after becoming the target of several assassination attempts, Rasputin slash Saint Germain faked his own death, allowed himself to be buried, and then tunneled out of his own grave. Of course he did. That sounds reasonable. People tunneling out of graves all the time. According to this story, it's not unclear if the revolution was caused by Saint Germain Rasputin or not. The narrative picks up in the late 1980s when the immortal causes the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe before relocating to Los Angeles. Of course he does! According to those in the know, Saint Germain's latest incarnation is comedian and solid character actor Kevin Pollock, best remembered for his performances in A Few Good Men and The Usual Suspects. I've heard of Kevin Pollock, Pollack, but I just need to look him up. He's one of these, if he's a character actor, he's one of these people who you usually remember his face, right? Oh yeah, I know this guy. Of course you know this guy. This dude, look, this guy. He's Rasputin. Of course he's not. That's ludicrous. You have to kind of lose yourself in it. You, you have to remember that all As this... he clearly has. Yes. <laughs> you got to lean into it. Uh -huh. Yeah.
I will not dignify this notion with a rhetorical question, does this make any sense, but I will ask Simon if the story of St. Germain, regardless of his ties to Rasputin, is interesting enough to be in a decoded episode in the future. I mean, yeah, maybe. Pitch it to me by email, Arnaldo, and we'll see where it goes. I need to know a little bit more about it, because if it's just one of those crazy conspiracy theories, which is just where I'm just going to be like, this is dumb, this is dumb, this is dumb, then it's not that interesting. But we'll see. Email me. Until then, I shall go and spend some more time with the minor, yes, important characters of this episode, Frau Aspirin, hoping to prevent what promises to be a massive headache. Thank you for your sacrifice, Arnaldo. This was a great episode. Enjoyed it. Nice to learn about Rasputin and the fact that, unsurprisingly, most of the things you've heard about him aren't true. Thanks for being here. If you enjoy the show, leave a review and a rating on Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. If you're watching on YouTube, like and subscribe. And I'll see you next time.